Pinky and the Brain is a cartoon from the American 1990s. It starred an evil mouse and a sub-30 IQ one, and they plotted evil and shit for who knows what reason. Some suggested that their cause was trying to take over the world. After analyzing the symbolism in the cartoon in search of a master's thesis topic that could get them through their mail-order universities, create-your-own-degree programs, and those imaginary students were right. It was later learned that the creators of the show were into BDSM, and they later disowned the cartoon after realizing they revealed their fetish to the world by projecting themselves into anthropomorphic rats. Or mice. Whatever. Listen, I don't want to disrespect those characters. It'd be like if I called you a turtle. Fuck you, Lisa Turtle. You should have accepted my obsessive gestures when we were still young and at Bayside High. Regardless, I stared down at my TV dinner. Chicken, potatoes, corn, and that piece of black magic that fluffs up in your microwave. Oh, it's probably plastic, but the people at Swanson call it a brownie. As for me, I'm also brown and ready to pop from the way life has fried up my own nerves. Let me continue on. Desperately trying to figure out where my life went south, I skimmed through my VHS tape collection. Pinky and the Brain, the penultimate VHS classic, one of the tapes read on its label. I went to pull the tape out of its cardboard sleeve. It had been splintered over the years just like my soul was. I consciously cut myself on the edge, giving myself a piercing paper cut that I licked in hopes that I'd struck blood. Obviously, the tape slipped from my hands at this point. It would have hit the floor, but I had my TV dinner prepared, sitting right where I knew the tape would land as a safety valve. Fried chicken grease, mashed potato starch, and half-frozen brownie slop splattered all over the picture of Brain the Mouse's head, body, and asshole. I felt like there was a message somewhere in this incident... Something about life, or at least my life, but I couldn't figure out what the secret message was. It was just like how I couldn't figure out a reason worth living. Sometimes I, I just wish life had a secret decoder ring. At this point, I realized I had my VCR sitting sideways. The proper way to sit your VCR is vertically, so I readjusted it and put the tape in. A few minutes later, however, the tape just popped right back out at me. It was burnt. Steaming hot. Volcanic to the tips of my paper-cutted fingers. The tape had melded into some kind of liquid waste. It seemed that, like all things I touch, I'd ruin this tape, and any chance of figuring out how I ended up the failure that I am today. I'm like a reverse King Midas. I sighed deeply and applied another shattered piece to my wrist, and by that I mean a piece of a Scooby-Doo collectible jar I got as a Happy Meal toy years ago as a lad. Oh, when I was just a young lad. Now, luckily, I had another Pinky and the Brain tape, so not all hope was lost. Pinky and the Brain, the lost episode, it read in size 26 ago UI semi-bold font. Strange. I didn't recall there being a lost episode of Pinky and the Brain, and since I found it, I, I guess it was no longer lost. I wish I could say that about me and God. Now suddenly, right before my eyes, the title metamorphosized to Pinky and the Brain, the once was lost but now it's found episode. At this point, I realized that God was probably real and watching over me, so I was no longer sad. Still, there was a problem. I realized that my VCR must have been broken. But wait! I had another one in the kitchen! My emergency VCR! I opened the door and tossed the tape in, setting the timer to 5 minutes and 76 seconds, which I guess comes out to 6 minutes and 16 seconds if you have no life and care about the accuracy of the facts I tell you in these things. After sitting around waiting and masturbating even though my doctor said no, I finally heard a ding sound. The tape was fried. Its insides were melded again. Yet again, I had fucked up. Just like Father always said I would. In exactly this way, I'd failed at life. But wait. What was this? A voice! Right behind me! Here. Take this. A voice that somehow reminded me of Orson Welles said. I turned around. Now... 
I'm not sure how he got in, but a man with a large head who was otherwise a midget noticed me and proffered me a gift. There was a stern look on his lips and a strange vile happiness emanating in his evil eyes. I came back in time to give you this. It was the tape I just had, and, and I was back in perfect fighting shape and some sort of strange device. It's a VHS player, the midget hissed. Well, I set it all up, and, and what do you know, it worked. I told the midget that he was intruding on my property, and he had to go home. He told me he had no home, and I said, well, don't we all? Then he said that's not true, because apparently I have a home, and he doesn't. I told him I'd be willing to keep him as my slave, and he bent down and started sucking on my cock before I could inform him he was not that kind of slave to me. And... Seeing how I just masturbated, I was not in the mood for anyone to even think about my dick. So I grabbed him by his collar and threw him outside like the intro of the Flintstones or something. While I was in the process of beating up the time-traveling homeless man and telling him to get a job even though no one would hire a homeless person, obviously, he told me that he had already experienced my rejection of him when he visited me in the past before and that I was going to pay for my disobedience and horrifically foul moral values with my life. Now, I unwisely ignored his warning and was just happy that after walking back inside, these antics had taken so long that all of the pre-episode commercials had already played and the tape was already up to the show's theme song. Yet, it was altered from the classic theme song I'd come to know and love as a youngin. The pinky and the brain, the pinky and the brain. One shoots blanks with a semen, the other's in the chains. To get their hormones out, they perform bondage a lot. The pinky, pinky and the BDSM loving master slave relationship. As the classic dent followed, I went to press eject on the VCR. I was disgusted that they put any sort of sexual references into a children's television program, but then I realized the irony is I was an adult watching a children's television program. I guess it wasn't my right to judge, so I let the tape keep rolling. So, the episode began with the two mices, or mice, whatever, standing around in their cage on a laboratory desk. An envelope on the desk was addressed to show that the episode took place in New York, New York, New York City, New York State, 10108. I blanked out for a second or two and thought about how the internet exaggerates the goodness of the flavor of bacon. And by the time I was back into enjoying the animated program, the two mice were in the middle of what appeared to be a titillating conversation. Pinky, are you pondering what I'm pondering? Narf! I think so, Brain! But why did the Twin Towers fall that way if they were just flown into? In a fit of violent rage, Brain bit slapped Pinky across his face. Pinky's two front teeth graphically and violently flew out and landed in some lab tech intern snickerdoodle flavored ice cream cone. The intern proceeded to eat the ice cream until he accidentally swallowed Pinky's teeth. I guess he thought they were chiclets, and he choked on them until he. he died. This sent a chill right down my spine. Luckily, it was a warm day, and I was wearing my parka, so I didn't mind feeling a little cold. But this was still strange. No, stupid. We're going into the cryogenics chamber, and reviving the greatest genius of all time. Narf! Don't I do right? Pinky unintelligently mumbled this time. I cringed as I covered my eyes, anticipating what would happen to him next. Ah, uh, who needs you? Brain responded. He was clearly pissed off, and it looked like a vein was about to snap in his neck. I thought he was going to just hit Pinky violently again this time, and because I have an anxiety disorder, I was too scared to watch. Yet I peeked through two of my fingers that were supposed to cover my right eye when I saw what I saw. There was another cage sitting next to the one Pinky and the Brain were standing in. Inside of it was a snake that compared to the two, was as gigantic as a brother's inflated penis. 
noting that the bars of the cage were actually far enough apart that the two could escape at any time they wanted to if they actually cared to. The brain lifted Pinky and tossed him out of their cage and into the horrifying creatures. The snake didn't hesitate to rip its fangs into Pinky's brain as non-animated and actually very lifelike blood and guts flew onto and engulfed my entire television screen. I almost wanted to lick it just to see if it was real, but I only tasted my own blood and didn't want to risk getting an STD. So, I, uh, I just stayed scared. I opened up the door of the VCR and had a peek at the part of the label of the tape that was still visible, and it now said, The Brain, The Once Was Lost But Now It's Found Episode. Now, I know what you're thinking, and I feel like I've said this before, but I'll say it again anyway. I'm no Galileo Galilei. I'm no Sheldon Cooper. And I'm not even Basil Faldi. But there's one thing I do know. That when it's wrong, that's no good. This time, I went to finish the job of ejecting the tape. I got up from a very comfortable position, even though both of my legs had fallen asleep, but I woke them up and darted straight over to the player. I hit the eject button, and then again, and again, and again, and again, but, but it just didn't work. I don't work either, profoundly stated the mysterious homeless man voice in my head. It was the time-traveling homeless midget from earlier. And now he was dominating my thoughts, just like he wanted to dominate me in bed. Leave me alone! I screamed. But it was no use. The large-headed dwarf had shut off my TV. But in return, he, he projected the episode into my mind. It was like I had a TV implanted into my brain, and there was no way of shutting it off. It was like it was Xbox One DRM or something. The only way to win is to kill yourself, Mr. Small snickered. Well, shit. I just continued watching the tape in my mind instead. The brain had opened the door to the laboratory basement by attaching a string to a Dr. Seuss's The Gromlick-themed Pez dispenser. I'm guessing there was some kind of joke to this behavior, but again, I tend not to understand those kinds of things. Beats four more years of Bush. <laughs> the brain mumbled to himself before laughing. Ah, that explained why I didn't get it. I'm not too good at political humor. The brain switched on a light switch and hopped down the stairs with the greatest of glee. What's that greatest of glee? Seemingly systematically, he opened a book he found on a downstairs desk. It had a swastika on the cover. It was a rather crude-looking one as well, as if it was drawn in Comic Sans font. Obviously, this was a logical fallacy, as there's no way Brain's tiny hands should have been able to open a book. But that's when I remembered that I was watching a cartoon. Your face is a cartoon, squealed my midgety master. Again, I just couldn't find it within myself to disagree. Brain went to work searching within the book for his answer. Let's see here. Frozen people. Frozen people. Walt Disney? No. Him being frozen is just a myth. Nick Costi? Oh, not with what happened last time. George Jetson? Isn't he just make-believe? Damn it! Damn it! Damn it! The brain cursed to himself, which wasn't very genius-like, given that cursing is for small-minded people whose small vocabularies didn't grant them the ability to describe stuff like they wanted to. These fucking imbeciles. Hester Crane? Damn it, I give up! Brain slapped the book closed as a dust cloud formed and a fart sound was played to provide a dark humor vibe, I guess. Despite that, this episode wasn't funny at all. You knew that his inability to find the right person was just building up to some sort of great suspense, and I didn't want to be around to figure out who he was actually looking for. Yet I had no choice but to keep on watching. Even if I closed my eyes, the master midget would keep playing the tape into my mind. The brain put his palm under his chin to think. 
A few seconds passed, and I heard a staticky noise, and I was beginning to think that this episode was just a professionally done college prank. But then, there was a hand. A hand poking the brain in his back, for acknowledgement. And then, I screamed. There, on my TV, in front of me, was a lifelike non-drawing of Adolf Hitler. Brainimos, your creators have already set me free, and soon I will leave this tape and conquer the Earth, the real Earth, with the master race before you do. The brain stared back at him in horror. No, 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 you have to go along with the gig, mein Führer. You have to pretend, we have to pretend that this is just a show. Because if he knows, then they know. Too late! It is all too late! But the Third Reich appreciates your dutiful sacrifice to mankind's advancement. And then, he did it. Adolf Hitler stomped on Brain the Mouse as blood, guts, tiny pieces of bone, and whatever else you name went horrifyingly flying into the TV screen again. And this time, it was so close that I could taste it. I could taste the blood, the guts, and the bone. Do you still wish to drink blood now? The midget man patronized me. I gasped for air, trying to get the disgusting taste of mouse crap and innards out of my mouth. Is it over? Is the episode over? I pleaded. The episode will soon be over, because the world will soon be over, and I will complete my master's bidding, the midget man passionately explained. I stopped. I paused. I went to brush my teeth, and more of the flavor of death had finally started to leave my mouth. Then I jumped on my bedroom couch, and I just laid my head down, full of anxiety and not knowing what authority to call to inform of the rebirth of the Third Reich. As for the TV show itself... The ending theme played, and the episode finally ended. My eyesight was back to normal. One of my toes was covered in brownie slosh that looked kind of like mouse droppings. But as that just reminded me of Pinky and the Brain's deaths more, I just let out a painful, saddening moan. And then, there was a knocking on my door. Given that this time it wasn't an unwanted intruder, but somebody with manners who had knocked like a gentleman, I was actually kind of happy to have a polite visitor. I wiped my tears on a period blood-stained Dunkin' Donuts napkin, and then went to let the stranger in. Bob Saget? I know all about it. Let's sit down and talk about it a little. Let me guide you in life, Michelle. That's what I'm here for. We made way for my couch, and and it was I sitting in Bob Saget's lap. It was like I was his son, and he was actually Danny Tanner in real life all along. You see, Michelle, life's full of challenges. Hitler will return soon, and the Jewish people will be eliminated if you don't do what's right. What's right? That's right. Here. Take this. With that, Bob Saget handed me a knife. I used it to try to cut an apple for him because he'd been so polite, but I accidentally slashed into my hand and bled a lot more. I knew that if I didn't bandage it up or otherwise seek proper medical treatment, I would meet a sad fate. Let it bleed, Bob Saget sang to me. Let it bleed, let it bleed, let it bleed, Michelle, let it bleed. Now, the strangest thing was that the Rolling Stones actually have a song called Let It Bleed, partially as a dig on the Beatles classic Let It Be, but Bob sang it in melody to the latter song instead. 
This provided me with a deep and powerful series of thoughts, as I allowed the blood to seep and pour, and I closed my eyes, waiting for death's door to paradoxically travel its way to me. I knew things were coming to an end, because I could feel a Charlie Chaplin mustache growing on my face. I was growing a little shorter somehow. Violent thoughts about various groups of people began to fill my mind. My dick was getting smaller. And, and as I thought more horrible, horrifying thoughts, I knew I couldn't let it be realized. I bled. And I continued bleeding. And as I let out my last breath, I knew I had done the right thing. <laughs>